What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Surf and Sales podcast. I am your host, Scott Leaf, here with my good friend and co-host, Richard Harris. And it's a lovely late August, uh, Monday morning, midday, whatever the heck time it is. My kids start school tomorrow, Richard. You're, have you started yet? One started uh, last week and one is starting um, after September 1st. So uh, oh, man, he's up at camp. I dropped him off yesterday. So, you know. Well, let me tell you, I can't wait to ship mine off school tomorrow because I'm about done I'm about done with them so we are brought to you today and all throughout the month of August by our good friends at Salesforce sales cloud as well as Vidyard so check them out as you're looking to uh, grow your pipeline through the second half of this year and get off to a great start in 2022 Salesforce sales cloud and Vidyard and we're here today with the vice president of business development from PeopleWork a guy by the name of Brent Getty and Brent and I have been getting to know each other a little while over the last uh, six to 12 months or so through COVID and, and uh, you know, networking and communities and all that kind of stuff. And Brent, this is his first ever podcast appearance. So welcome to the show, Brent. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I uh, hope I don't screw it up too bad here. No, you won't. Just well, buckle up. That's it. So. Yeah. I mean, we usually screw it up good enough for everybody else. So right. you know, there's, there's a very low, low pressure. So Brent, tell everybody, um, you know, about people work real quick and, and kind of give people some context for what you do and what the sales motion is like and all that good stuff. Yeah, great. So uh, I am brand new to this role. I've been here about 75 days, but people work is a skill based hiring platform and we look to launch people into an equitable career path. So primarily working with younger adults kind of in the staffing space and helping them find uh, what's going to be next for them. Was oh, this like uh, career services or something like that? So we that's what we I think of. Some, I think about when I yeah. went into the career services department at Arizona State or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to bag on my career services colleagues too hard, but no, we uh, we teach people about the real world of work. So, like how to read your paycheck stub or how to tell what kind of things attached, how to use SharePoint, how to use Salesforce. Uh, all of those yeah. things are, are integrated into our our real life. And then we help these young adults kind of launch their career and understand where they want to be. So we use a combination of machine learning and our AI technology. We have some really cool uh, facial software that, that scans your face and helps tell what kind of personality you have. Uh, I was on Richard's uh, call a few weeks ago with the hostage negotiator. We use a lot of the same tactics, but it's automated. And uh, it's it use all of those things together to help these these young adults and then eventually uh, all adults get into a great, great path for their career. Now, business development as a term can mean a million different things. So what does it mean for you and in and, and the day to day details of your your job? Well, don't screw with me, but I, I think of sales, I think of more transactional and business development taking a little bit longer. I know you're a transactional okay. sales guy. Uh, so <laughs> for, <laughs> or, or were, I guess that's your roots, right? Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I do our business development. So I'm working with, you know, ISD partners and colleges to bring in our talent into our pipeline. And then I'm working on the B2B side and managing our team that goes out and works with the companies that want to use our platform to either hire or upskill their current uh, staff. And do you focus just on salespeople or, or is it everybody? We are everybody. Uh, okay. So, you know, I primarily work with younger adults right now. So 16 to 26. And then we help those guys pick what's right for them because college isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. We think college is unanswer, not the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of our guys are ready to go straight to work. Some of them want to go to trade school. Some of them mm -hmm. want to go to sales you or surf and sales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Help, help cool. them find the right choice. So, so then... I'm trying to understand. So, how does I'm trying? How, how do you approach selling then to your clients? Because you do you sell to the HR department? Do you sell to the leader of marketing and engineering to help figure that out? Like on the B two B side of the business, how right. do you guys figure that in? So uh, we're approaching sometimes HR managers, a lot of time the direct hiring managers. You know, I think back to. Uh, you know, throughout my career in sales, a lot of times it, I had scenarios where I could go out and make it rain, but we didn't have the right workforce pipeline to support what I sold. Mm 
So do you so, stop right there? Hold on. Yep. Do you think HR can hire good salespeople? A broken clock is right twice a day. Right. So, <laughs> just say it. Just say it, Brent. Like, no. No, I think. Uh, yeah. So uh, no, I I think my best sales hires have come through. I want. I don't, I don't care about somebody's pedigree when I'm hiring somebody in sales. I want to hire somebody that, that wants, I care more about your personality type and how you solve a problem than where you went to school or, or where you came from. Okay. That's great. Now, what, what's, what's, the, what's the key in finding the right salesperson to sell into to HR versus IT, which I know you used to sell into IT. What's the difference is there? You know, what are you trying to, to optimize for? Yeah, so great question. I think um, the personality fits, you know, IT, I found when I was selling to them, I needed somebody that could present themselves as a truly technical expert. And you get that working with HR, you have to be probably more focused on the soft side of the sale. Very, very deep into uh, you know, the, the feeling and the methodology behind it, you know, our, it's a different technical aspect. So like we, part of our software increases your DNI. And I think that's a big mission for a lot of HR people right now is how do we create a more diverse workforce? And so being able to talk to that without getting overly technical about how we're doing it, but being able to bounce right back because some HR leaders are overly technical. And I think the, the type of people that you're selling to is is so much of a wider range with HR than it was with my IT sales. So how do you go after that specific buyer persona, the like super technical HR <clears throat> HR person? I'm ha I'm having like a panic attack over here, Richard. Imagining myself trying to sell to a super technical HR person. I don't know about you. It, uh, it doesn't bother me. I I probably do better with the. I mean, you know me, Scott, I probably do better with the technical side of things because it's so direct and black and white where you're all squishy and can live in the gray area and can sort of morph. <laughs> but he can't like he's, he can morph himself in personality personality ways where I I just that's just not one of my stronger skill sets. So, um, you know, so I, I think the key to that was the technical side, Scott, not the HR department. So, yeah, and I think I went go for it, Brent. No, say when when selling to your technical HR, I think Richard hit the nail on the head. You you have to be a chameleon. So when you're selling to the technical piece, you want to to focus on the black and the white and focus on the skills. And then when you get your as you call them squishy HR, you've got to uh, you got to sit back and and let them feel good about it. It is um, it's an exercise in uh, being a chameleon. For I don't know how else to describe it. Let, let's talk about this, right? What makes you, why are people, I mean, COVID's different, right? Like, so I get it. Like people are just tired and burnt. And I just had this conversation the other day that, you know, people are bouncing because they're stuck inside all the day. They may not dislike their job. They're just bouncing because they just feel like they need to control something different. And the money's better, right? Like the, right now it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's an employee market. But before that, why are people bouncing every two years? Or is it, well, Richard and Scott, you guys just live in the startup world. You have no idea what it's like in Poughkeepsie, you know? Um, so what's your thought behind that? I mean, I, I too have bounced every few years. Um, you know, the, the longest I ever worked for any saw that was... coming, Scott. He saw that, <laughs> he saw that, uh, me laying that out there. So. Well, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's not the first time he's dealt with this before. Yeah, that, not at all. I think, uh, you know, I, coming from a startup and small business world, I think bouncing every few years, sometimes you outgrow the role, sometimes you outgrow your boss. And I think if you have a great boss that's developing you, you're gonna have to go. And you may be a boomerang and come back and work for that same boss again and again. I've seen it with a lot of my friends and colleagues where they left a boss and ended up coming back to the same boss at a different company three years down the road. That's why Scott, I can't get rid of Scott. He keeps coming back to me. Right. He, just, he, he, just, he just can't quit me. So. <laughs> <laughs> the 
the boomerang analogy is great. <laughs> That's really good. What um, what are you seeing differently? Because you, you know, you as you said, you guys have an AI piece. As we think about sales, what are you seeing differently in the personalities of those who are coming out of college or in or you know, let's let's call it first sales job, oftentimes early 20s, not always, right? So a lot of people are transitioning now into sales because they realize the money's there. But what do you see in the difference between the personalities at, you know, the Gen Z age versus millennial versus, you know, the Gen Xers of the world? Are you seeing how they operate or view sales differently? Yes. And we have an internal document with God knows how many pages on each. Uh, you know, I think the millennials are, they're scorned at this point. They are very bitter and, you know, a lot of them are turning to sales because they need to make more money. You know, they don't necessarily love it. I think your, your Gen Zers are approaching problems differently. They approach problems on a gig level. And we've seen that across the economy with, you know, the advent of Uber and everything else. The job to them is a means to an end. And I think uh, as we evolve with our, our marketplace and our work that it's going to continue to evolve towards the Gen Z level where you're going to have very deep subject matter experts. Somebody's in sales at that level because they either want to make a lot of money or they just love it or both. Does that you answer your question? A little bit. So millennials are turning into Gen X is what I'm hearing because they're angry and grumpy. What are <laughs> they, what, but, but what, what are those things that, that are making them frustrated realistically. And then on the flip side, I'd love to get some feedback on how are you, how do you encourage managers to navigate the difference between the generations? Because it's important, right? So what, what's is. frustrating the millennials at this point? I think the millennials are frustrated by the, you know, they are still largely attached to the baby boomer way of of doing things. I had to go to college and I had to do these steps to become, you know, an SDR to be, you know, move up to a manager of sales, to move up to a director of sales and, and keep going up. And they're seeing some of these Gen Zers that come in on a hyper focused level and maybe step right into a manager or director role that they may or may not be ready for. Uh, and I think they're, they're angry because they feel like these guys should wait their turn and they're getting kind of jumped. Um, you know, from, from both sides there. Um, so I think from a manager, how do you manage that expectation? I think I manage a hundred percent to performance. I want guys that are playing golf or going to the lake on Fridays because they're crushing their sales numbers so hard. And I want the same guy that's, you know, going to come in, even though he's crushing his number because he wants to make more money. And so do you feel like managing to performance is regardless, right? Like that's how you would always do it. That's how I've always done it. Yeah. Um, I think that especially what, in a sales role. Go ahead, Scott. Well, what, about, what about those people who don't value those things the same way that, that you did or, or, or I did or do, frankly? You know, I mean, I hear that more and more and more. I mean, I, here's a hypothesis. I bet if we took that quote and said, I want to hire the people, the guys and gals who, you know, want to bounce on Fridays because they smash their number or, you know, smash their number. And while they're at the lake or the beach house, uh, you know, or putting in work to try to smash it even more. Like I bet we would get a lot of smoke coming our way. Like, I don't care about that kind of stuff. And, you know, things are, things are different now. I want more balance. How do you manage those people, keep them motivated to still hit the numbers and goals and targets that, you know, you have as a, as a sales leader. So I'm a big, big believer in constant, almost over communication. Uh, I want to continually tell you not only what I expect of you, but why. And so there is no gray area with me. I, I think managing to that level, like if you're managing to a certain quota and they're getting it done and if they want to exceed it great but if not they've, they've met that bare minimum like if if i had every rep that hit quota and stood that for the year we'd all get our nut and be fine so i think just 
continuing to talk to them about why. And if they, if it takes them, you know, six days a week to do it or three days a week, I don't care. What, um, so it's interesting you say this because I, I ran into this a little bit ago. It was a couple of years now, but um, I wonder if millennials are as much like baby boomers or are they just growing up? They're kind of fed up with like, they finally have realized that you have to do hard work, right? They're starting to realize you just don't get promoted because you want it, right? You got to prove it. And now they're getting frustrated by the same activities that they used to do <laughs> by the new, by the generation behind them, right? Like, is there a maturity going on? Um, and, you know, what we've been told, uh, so anyway, I, I don't know, like, it's, it's an interesting conversation. We've been told by Dr. Howard Dover at the University of Texas, Dallas, that, you know, the, the millennials are much more lifestyle oriented and Gen Z is actually more like the baby boomers, which is transactional, like pay me, like show me the money because they've been through, they've had to live through two downturns, right? Where, where millennials only live through one, so to speak. Um, and by the time the second, this last one came in the last year, they have, you know, they're on their own. Whereas Gen Z's live through two of them watching their parents having to go through it. So I'm just, I'm curious how you see that or if that changes your opinion or, you know, what you think. Yeah, I think they're, to your point, their goals are different. I mean, the millennials is, are, seem to be a very experiential generation. They don't care about the China and the crystal that my parents loved. I think that was a big thing for my parents when they, you know, got married and filled up the China cabinet of dishes we never used. I don't get it. Uh, you know, I'm firmly a Gen Xer, so I'm, I'm somewhere in between. I, I definitely like some of my nice toys, but I just assume go travel too. So, you know, I feel kind of hybridized between those two. And then for the Gen Zers, I, they truly want, they want to be paid for current value and future value, mm -hmm. not, uh, not past accomplishments. Yep. And that's been a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. Um, for a lot of people that are, you know, pay your dues, get this right. done. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that, I think the pay your dues thing has always been a generational issue. I don't, you know, how far you go back. That's a, sort of how it's always been this meritocracy piece and lifestyle matters and social, um, social belief systems that, you know, matter now uh, more than they used to. They're on the forefront and those things. So it's, it's a combination of all that stuff. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to shift and I'm going to, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. So, you, you know, you've got an MBA, right? right. Um, what is your MBA in just so people know? That's just general. I went to the executive MBA program at SMU. There is no specialization. That okay. one. So, do you feel like you needed it? Do you need a higher degree to reach success, you know, to reach your level? It's not required. Right. There is a lot of things that I got out of it that were very helpful. Uh, but I am probably the only guest you've ever had that doesn't have a bachelor's and has an MBA. Really? Uh, so I didn't yeah, even know you could, I didn't even know you could do that. Right. Yeah. You know, if you if you write the right amount of checks. Uh, no, I mean, uh, they, they gave me some some great life experience credit at SMU. Um, so the part of my story we didn't discuss, uh, just to give you a little background, is I I went to college. I played hockey in college and then I left college early to play professional hockey in the minors uh, through my mid 20s before I realized that I was oversized and under talent. And uh, that's me. Uh, I got the same problem. <laughs> hey. I just so, don't know what my talent is. Yeah, Oversized and under-talented. I love yeah. that. So, you know, and I, my hockey career was, was based on aggressive negotiations. I think my last year pro, I had something like one goal and seven assists and 250 penalty minutes, I think. So I got thrown out of almost every game. And, <laughs> he's uh, the enforcer. He's, he's, enforcer. Like, uh, he's like yeah. Happy Gilmore. Right? Yeah, yeah, Happy 100%. Gilmore. But, uh, you know, for somebody like me, it was a big difference. I couldn't. I, I had to work in SMBs because they're the ones that didn't seem to care as much about having a degree. So when I got my MBA, I thought I was going to come out and go work in venture capital 
uh, or go work for the AT&Ts and the Kessens of the world. And when I realized halfway through is I didn't want to work for those companies. Well, hold on. I want to go back. Yeah. How did you even apply for an MBA without an undergraduate degree? Like that's a so great- I knew that I wanted an MBA. I always knew that I wanted an MBA. Um, and I saw the relationships. I, I worked for a guy who was an SMU MBA and I, I saw him being able to pick up the phone and get deals done where I was roadblocked because of relationships. So I knew having something in that vein to carry more political capital, you know, personal capital was very important to me. So you were uh, so, able, so so you applied for this MBA program, or you you yeah. so relationship your way through before yeah. you applied. So no, I called them up because uh, I was looking at it, and I called them up and I said, "Hey, do you guys care where I finish? Can I go to like a Western Governors or like a UNT or you know, do I do I need to go to like TCU or something to get a you know a more prestigious degree to get in? Because the executive MBA at SMU is a, like a fairly high rank program." Uh, in the scheme of things. And they just looked at my background and said, you, you don't. I said, what? And they said, well, based on your, you know, you've sold a couple companies that you started, you've got some great technology experience. We, we can let you in without one. We have a waiver. Um, and I said, yeah, no, no kidding. Uh, and so I went in and met with the dean and like seven days after I told my wife, I was thinking about going back to school. I got accepted. I wrote a check and then I called her and said, hey, I just wrote a check to SMU and I, I just got in. Scott, uh, so. for you now. <laughs> uh, I'm, I can't believe this waiver situation. This is amazing. <laughs> I can't believe Scott didn't pull this off himself. Someone who's yeah, out, yeah. Scott Lease. Scott Lease. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if I can get a waiver for a PhD program. Maybe I'll just right. get a PhD. Here's the, here's the beauty of this story, though, Richard, which you'll, you know that I'm going to pick on you now. It, it took Brent seven days to go from having the idea to, like, fully – taking out dude cut a check got accepted and cut a check in seven days that type of efficiency and speed and execution of an idea the action is outstanding so i can i commend you for that that's bold that's Thank awesome you. that's really really yeah. cool so so talk so go back to you know my original question which was you know needing the degree right um because I don't think you need one, particularly in sales. Well, he said he got a lot out of it. So what are the benefits, maybe? Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, fair. So I I knew enough about finance before to be dangerous. Uh, just having the practical experience and, and running through the stuff has been very helpful. Could I have gotten that out there places? Absolutely. Uh, the relationships have been, you know, I think an MBA, no matter where you get it from, is worth about 50 grand in education. Um, you know, I think mine was a little bit more than that, a little more than double that, I think. Uh, and I would have paid double what they charged me for the classmates and network that I have out of it. Like to be able to pick up the phone and get stuff done now, like yeah. it is not the knowledge that I got, it's the people. And so, I mean, if you're going to do an MBA, I think you have to don't do an online program, go in person, meet these people, forge your relationships. The same thing we do in sales talk to people, give them a reason to want to work with you and continue to, to serve them. And then when you pick up the phone and ask for something, they, they do it. So I, I want to go back because you talked a little bit about, you know, and I didn't realize this part too, is like, you know, here you are this hockey player, but you also sold some businesses. You self-educated yourself a lot. So how do you, you gave yourself, you know, the, the undergraduate degree in life. Right, which I, it, it sounds like anyway. How, what motivated you to, to, to learn those things? Is that just who Brent is? Is that, you know? I th- yeah, maybe a little bit who Brent is. I think it was survival. So my first company uh, was a hockey school and it, was, uh, it seemed like a way to get more money because when I was coaching private lessons, I was making you know, 60, 80 bucks an hour. I figured out that if I would run a camp that enough people would come to it and I could make 500 or a thousand dollars an hour and increase my brand. And so it was just purely a hustle because I was poor. I, you know, we didn't make a whole lot of money in minor league hockey. Uh, And so it was, is how can I supplement my income to the max? How can I turn it to an 11? So that's how the first company started. And I sold it uh, for, you know, basically cost plus a little goodwill. I didn't make a ton of money off of it. Uh, but yeah, all but, of my, but it's still your story. That's the important piece. Yeah. 
someone just said, oh, like, you know, like we, I know several people who built a company and sold it and they didn't necessarily make any money, but they got a story out of it that shows success, right? right. So that, that, is, that is super, super. But then you, you leverage that story moving forward, right. which allows you to make more money or maybe start on the 40 yard line instead of the 20 yard line kind of a thing, yeah. right? 100%. So you, you don't make direct money, perhaps, but you make, you know, like futures. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's so funny. I can Richard, has, Richard has Richard has given me a deadline. I now have seven days to start a, uh, a baseball, baseball club school. or or a, or a soccer school or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Stick around next next week to find out if I've done that or not. Uh, <clears throat> go ahead, Richard. I was I was going to ask you what advice do you give to the to the folks who are getting into sales for the first time, right? You know, and uh, you know. What do you tell them? Because you're going through these things with personalities, right? You're, you're, it sounds like you're talking to people of multiple generations, but what's the advice you give them early? So when I first started in my sales career, I did it off of hustle and charisma. And while I think those two are still important, I now have a very like, precise process. And so I, I tell them to, you know, like plan their work and work the plan as simple as that sounds like find out what the process is and why and, and find a mentor in your organization or out of it that will help you understand the process like sales, like any other thing, if you want to be great at it, you've got to know what you're doing and know what you can, what levers to pull on to change it. Yeah. So understand the process more than the product. I, I don't give a shit what industry you're in. I love that line. Understand the process yeah. more than the product. So I think that's that's probably it. I, if I had to boil it down to one sentence, understand your process. So how how are we, in your opinion, here, Brent? How are we supposed to uh, train and onboard and replicate, you know, the in-person environment in a remote, potentially first or or a hybrid kind of world? That seems to be the number one pushback that I hear, um, legit pushback at least, it's like, okay, well, you know, how are we going to train all these people? It's going to take us longer to get them ramped because it's harder to, you know, coach them up to teach them this process, to teach them our product. How are you? How do you think about getting around that? Yes, yeah, so I think if you if you truly believe it takes you longer to train somebody remote, it's because you don't understand your process well enough. So, Amen. Say it again, like. Yeah. Scott and I've been doing this for years remotely and it just feels natural to us. And people, people always ask me, well, how do you do it? And I'm like, sometimes it's hard to explain because it's just normal for me. Right. But I think if you wanted to replicate you, you're going to have to write down all the steps. I mean, I think back to, I'm sure you've seen the videos or done it with your kids where you tell them to give you all the instructions to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And they uh, inevitably screwed up. They don't tell you to open the jar. Don't tell you to stick the uh, the knife in the peanut butter. Or whatever. I think that is equally important when you're onboarding somebody in a remote situation. You have to understand to the nth degree what your process is, and you have to be able to communicate that. So I've created like a playbook that I'm still building. That is, you know, you can drill down through it. If you look at it, it's a very high level, but every single one of them is a link and you can go deeper and deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole and get to the level of understanding that you need. I think uh, coupling that with, you know, constant teams meetings, my first 30 days, I met with our CEO every day virtually for at least 30 minutes. And that was part of the, when I agreed to onboard, that was part of my requirement was you have to carve out 30 minutes a day for me for the first month. So how are you using that 30 minutes? I think that's, I think that's good advice in particular uh, almost like baking that into your offer in, in, in a way, right? Like, because everybody says to you, I'll build out your 30, 60, 90 plan. I've heard very few people say, well, part of my plan in my first 30 days is you have to meet with me, Mrs. CEO, every single day for 30 days. I think that's brilliant. But what are you talking about every day for yeah. 30 days? So uh, the, the first day it was, she created a document for me that had, uh, very specific learning goals and the resources where I would learn them and then what I was supposed to get out of them. And so I would ask questions because they inevitably were, they were good. 
but I would have questions because I came from a different background than she did. You know, she wrote them like a chief HR officer and I approached them like a sales guy. So it was every day, why, why, why? If I had to say like one question, it was why, you know, what, you know, why and what are we doing this? And in my first 75 days, I have, uh, I convinced us we changed our pricing model. We changed, you know, defined our ICP. We've started giving some of the software away. I mean, it was, and all of this came from those conversations and starting and saying a bunch of why are we doing this? And if she couldn't boil it down simply, I would go back and we went back and forth productively uh, to boil everything down into the simplest of terms. And I think of it like an iPhone. How simple can you make an incredibly complex device? And if you can't get it into a 15 second you know, sound bite, you probably don't understand it well enough. So the, the overall in question is why. And I asked why about everything. She was sick of why by the end of the 30 days, I have no doubt. That's awesome. Um, we got we to gotta sort of move to wrap, but um, this has been a fun one because this has been like a lightning round of so many cool topics and things we haven't talked about. I'm, I know Scott's still frustrated by how much money he spent on his undergraduate degree um, before he was <laughs> in VA. So. No, no, not, I'm not. I'm not worried about me. I'm. I'm. I'm going to use this in the future because of my my kids. I was going to say I'm, for I'm your thinking. next two, for your two yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, anyway, a quick shout out to Vidyard and Salesforce Sales Cloud. Uh, please uh, support those folks for supporting us and supporting you in the world of sales growth and sales enablement and pipeline and um, growing revenue. So, thank you to to both of them. Um, you know, we always turn this around, Brent, you know, what question do you have for us? What would you like to ask us? So, uh, I've been tasked with something that's a little bit out of my, uh, my comfort zone. You know, I'm creating a, a digital marketing strategy. So a digital what strategy, a digital marketing strategy. Okay. So she, our CEO has tasked me with owning everything that is under revenue, uh, at, being something that's out of my comfort zone, how do you approach when you're trying to get something that is maybe adjacent to your skill set? How do you approach a problem when it's uh, out of your knowledge? Like, what overarching yeah. advice would you guys offer me for that? Well, I, I only have one real piece of advice, and and that's go find somebody who knows how to do this and who's sure. done it many times before. <clears throat> yeah, and you know, get a get a coach basically, or have as many free conversations um as you possibly can with people that you've built relationships with and network with so you know i reach out to some of my friends so i'd be reaching out to gatano denardi uh who's the at next diva and kyle lacy who's at lessonly slash seismic congratulations kyle <clears throat> and oh you know all these people that that i that i've worked with matt kaufman who runs marketing at, at qualia so i would be going you know and cashing in a few favors for the things that I've done to help them be like, Hey, I've been tasked with this thing. I don't know how to do it, or I've never done it before. Or, you know, here's what I'm thinking. Can you gut check that I'm on the right path? So I, I, I go reach out to those, those folks. And I probably join a few, you know, marketing kind of communities. Like Dave Gerhardt has a Patreon group. Uh, Chris Walker um, has a community. I can't remember the name of it right now. Sorry, Chris. Uh, a community for, for marketers that that meets kind of a la Thursday night tales, except for marketers. Um, and I just immerse myself in other people's knowledge and implement what they tell me. Any, anything you'd add to that, Richard? Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a copycat league, right? Like just as you know, like Scott and I have been trying to to poke into professional sports for sales training, and they all use the same people, and they all don't use technology, and they all sort of go this old school route because. No one wants to be the first, right? So uh, find those people that Scott's talking about, and you know, and and appropriately copycat them, right? Always give credit where credit's due. But you know, we had uh, I won't say who because I don't want to get them in trouble. We had one person say, "Look, I just go and you know listen to what other people say and say it enough and so much that people start to think I said it." Um, I don't know if you remember that, Scott, but I do. <laughs> uh, the other thing I would say is, you know. Go to, go to your millennials and go to your Gen Zs and just YouTube this shit, right? Like just follow them, right? You're gonna copycat somebody, see if somebody's got it out there, which I think is what Scott's also saying. Like go find them, 
sometimes it's free, right? You might be able to listen to, you know, find a, a podcast or two and you can run it at one and a half or two X speed. So it's faster, you know, but I do agree with Scott on, you need to have some live conversations because particularly because what's happened in the last 18 months, nobody's been through. I don't care how smart they say they are. I don't care how many MBAs they have or whether they worked at McKesson or Bain or any of these places, ain't nobody done what's happening now, right? Um, everybody's having to redefine product market fit about once a quarter, right? Um, and they're hiding behind that statement by saying we have to adjust our revenue targets, uh, which that's what I see. So um, so I would, I would find those people and ask them. I'm going to flip it back to you. What have you done so far? Or was it, you know, this happened last week, so I have, I'm just starting to figure it out. So this happened on Friday, uh, okay. and I've already reached out to a classmate from SMU, and she was, mm -hmm. shout out to Bethany. She was awesome. Uh, she gave me some resources to look at and said, when you have your framework, send it back to me. Yep. So there you go. You know, glad to hear I'm on the right path. There you go. So, uh, you know, so anyway, I want to, you know, Brent, it's been great to get to know you. Um, we didn't even get to talk. By the way, I have one last question for you. I don't yeah. know if Scott might know because I told him a long time ago. First of all, what hockey team were you playing through? Were you were you in the were you in like the private semi pro league or were you actually part of a farm system? So I spent some time with the Utah Grizzlies that were in the Western States League, and we were unaffiliated. The year after I left, they became affiliated with the Dallas Stars, and then I was out in Orlando with the Seals who had a, uh, an unofficial affiliation with the Lightning. Right. Uh, I never belonged to anybody important. Yeah. So here's, I'm from Macon, Georgia. And we have- oh, Macon Whoopi. There you, that was what I was going to ask. Did you know the name of our farm team? So it was the Macon. Yeah. Nice. So they, um, <laughs> they became the Macon Tracks. And when I was in Orlando, we, we played them as the Macon Tracks. And I was really bummed out that they got rid of the name because that was the greatest name in all the sports. It's the greatest name. And their gear, the problem was their gear was terrible. Like, I would love to get, like, gear. They were eventually, partially they were part of the Maple Leafs organization, as I recall, uh, at one point. Um, but, Scott, did you know that? Did I ever tell you about the Naked Whoopies? Yeah, I remember. I, I remember. Anyway, all right. Well, Brent, it's been fun. Thank you for joining us, man. Thanks for having me, guys. This was awesome. And, uh, you know, not being too rough with the first time we're here. Good job, Brent.